Um, so to start off, uh, Jeff, I really appreciate it. At the end of chapter one, you uh, gave a brief explanation of your title, uh, Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, uh, which on first reading could potentially suggest a more instrumental argument that we need to save animals in order to save humanity. Uh, but you complicate this a bit. So I thought you could maybe start out by um, sharing the multiple meanings of the title and how it relates to some of the overall arguments of your book. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for for giving me the opportunity to to complicate it a little bit right away. And also, thank you, Anthony, for uh, suggesting this session and inviting me and Lauren. And thank you, Lauren, for taking time out of what I know is a busy schedule to, <laughs> to read the book and, and have a conversation with me about it. I really appreciate it in both cases and to everybody here, of course, for being a part of the conversation as well. Looking forward to talking with all of you about this, which I, I do think is an important and neglected topic, so it'll be great to uh, be able to talk about it. So yes, I call the book Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, and that can suggest many things. As you say, it could suggest an instrumentalizing attitude. We should save animals in order to save ourselves because saving animals will be good for humanity. And it can also suggest a sort of savior role, that, that our role in this is to uh, help and save other animals. We are the heroes of this story. And, and I do think that to some degree that is a good way of thinking about this initially. So first of all, it is true that we need to, in various ways, save animals in order to save ourselves from ourselves. We need to uh, reduce our exploitation and extermination of non-human animals in order to mitigate the risk of human-caused pandemics and climate change and other global threats. And uh, so to that degree, we need to harm animals less in order to, to mitigate various threats that humanity faces. And uh, if, if we increase our support for animals, for example, by learning more about their health, by improving their health in various ways, then that too can benefit humanity by reducing the spread of various zoonotic diseases and reducing certain kinds of conflicts between humans and other animals. So there is absolutely an element of truth to the idea that if we save animals, that can have good consequences for humanity. And that is part of why we should do it. And we should, to some degree, really be trying to help and save animals for reasons that we might talk about in our conversation today. Animals are suffering and dying all over the world. Often this is preventable. Often this is human caused. And for various reasons, one simply being that suffering and death is bad, all else being equal, and, and another being that often we are specifically why the suffering and death is happening and we have a responsibility to reduce and repair harms that we specifically are causing. For all of those reasons, when we can help animals ethically and effectively, arguably, I believe we have the responsibility to do so. So, so to that degree, that all is correct. But uh, it might not always be the case that we should save animals. Sometimes saving animals or attempting to save animals would do more harm than good. It would have all sorts of bad side effects or other consequences. We might not have the knowledge or power or other tools that we need in order to do that work well, um, or, or it might require interfering with animals in, in morally bad ways or otherwise doing things that are morally bad or morally wrong. And in those cases, it might not be a good idea to save animals, even when they are suffering and even when we are responsible for that suffering. Um, and saving animals might not always be enough, like simply pulling animals out of rivers, <laughs> rescuing them from, from fires and floods is only a small part of what we should be doing in order to, uh, in order to address all of the many problems that humanity is creating for humans and other animals. We also need to uh, improve the health and well-being of animals in other ordinary ways, and we need to uh, change the social and political and economic and ecological structures within which humans and other animals are interacting. And, and those are really important and arguably the, the most important things that, that we should be doing with respect to our treatment of other animals, but it might be a stretch to think of those as, as cases of saving animals. So yeah, I think we should save animals uh, in order to save ourselves by saving ourselves. I think the title has a lot of meanings, but we have to take them all with a grain of salt and, and uh, think about this in a complicated way. Thanks so much. And actually that leads uh, really well into uh, one of the first things I wanted to chat about, which was this idea of complexity. And so one of the things I liked most about the book uh, is the acknowledgement of complexity, uh, yet the sort of pragmatism in the face of it. So you don't try to simplify or skirt over some of the vast complexities of these issues, 
Um, but you do use some simplified tangible examples to illustrate just how complex the dynamics can be. Uh, for one example, the uh, concept of multi-species justice, where you ask you know, justice for whom, and point out that environmental changes uh, will entail winners and losers. Um, any sort of change is going to create better circumstances for some and worse for others. So to say um, unequivocally that something like climate change is bad for other species and rewilding is good, um, it isn't quite so simple when we think about who might be benefiting or not, uh, both at the individual and the species level. Mm -hmm. um, but you also write that we shouldn't allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, we can represent current and future humans and non-humans better than we are. So we shouldn't be letting these um, complexities or our uncertainties about impacts prevent us from acting. Um, but I, I would love to hear more about in practice, how can we can get past some of this paralysis uh, around the immense complexity of these issues? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is one of the, the main themes of the book and one of the most important things that I think we need to grapple with around this topic, because there are two things that I think are true. And uh, I, I think a lot of people think one or the other is true, but, but holding both in our heads at the same time is really difficult because it creates a lot of tension. And one is accepting that we have a responsibility to address these issues, for example, to uh, address factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade, re reducing or, or ending these industries that are causing so much harm to humans and other animals, and that we have a responsibility to address at least human-caused uh, animal suffering, including wild animal suffering, by, by helping animals, including wild animals, to the degree that we can do so ethically and effectively. So we have these vast responsibilities with respect to our global economy and ec ecology. But on the other hand, we also have profound limitations about how much we can do to uh, ethically and effectively address these problems at scale at present, because our economies and ecologies are so complicated and we have so little knowledge about them and, and so, so little capacity and infrastructure for, for really uh, uh, predicting and controlling our impacts on them in a, a thoughtful way right now. And so it can be easy to accept that we have these responsibilities and then to rush into all these interventions that are not very thoughtful and not and and not likely to do more good than harm and, and that would be bad but it can also be easy to see how how many limitations we have and how complicated these issues are and to treat that as an excuse for inaction well we don't have the knowledge or capacity or infrastructure that we need and and it might do more harm than good if we try to do something so maybe we should do nothing or maybe we should wait 10 years and then another 10 and then another 10 and i think I think those are both important points, but not the whole story. And, and the first step is really holding both of those thoughts in our heads at the same time and just trying to strike a, a balance by, by embracing the complexity as much as possible, thinking through our, our impacts as much as possible, thinking about if I reduce meat consumption in this region, is it going to cause meat consumption to increase in some other region in a way that, that neutralizes the, the benefits? Or if I help this animal, is that going to just cause them to suffer later or will it cause some other animal to suffer because it deprives them of a meal or it turns them into a meal or it in some other way disrupts food systems or, or uh, ecologies? So you have to think about those questions. And you also have to think about basic philosophical questions like which animals matter and how much do they matter? And if there are trade-offs between vertebrates and invertebrates or between humans and other animals, how can we weigh those trade-offs in a just way? So there are scientific and ethical uncertainties that we have to grapple with, but we also have to grapple with the reality that human activity is, is changing the world much faster than animals can adapt or evolve to keep up. And so ultimately we're going to have to take some, some uh, risks here and, and make some interventions and just do the best we can and then learn from our mistakes and go from there. So, so as a general matter, I think we need to strike a balance between accepting our responsibilities and accepting our limitations, and then just try to, to, to hold both of those things together as, as we move forward. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and I think this sort of uh, leads to another question I had or something I was hoping we could discuss, which is uh, this idea of ethical convergence that you bring up in the book. Um, and so a lot of your, your arguments are grounded in 
utilitarian arguments and you do um, bring in rights-based frameworks as well, but you also talk about the ways in which things like values, duties, virtues, relationships are all important to consider, um, which I think can be complicated in practice to sort of bring all of these things together in, as you say, an integrated and holistic manner. Uh, so I would just love to hear some more from you about why it's important to bring together different frameworks and maybe some of the challenges and opportunities of doing so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so in ethics, we, we have these different theories or schools of thought, and they all argue for a particular perspective about what is most valuable or what we most ought to do or how we, we ought to relate to each other. And so one kind of theory says ethics is about the consequences and we should be trying to maximize happiness and minimize suffering in the world. Another says ethics is about rights and, and we should be living our own lives in a way that leaves others alone and, and respects their rights and allows them to live their lives. And then there are still other schools of thought about cultivating virtuous character traits or caring relationships with, with others. And it can be easy to think of these as all diametrically opposed and adversarial. So, so only one can win. Ethics is either about consequences or about rights or about character traits or uh, about relationships. But in practice in the real world, I think each of these theories, each of these uh, perspectives has good reason to care about all of the other ones too. And so no matter what your starting point is, if your starting point is consequences or rights or anything else, you are going to have some reason to look to the other theories for insights and incorporate some of their insights into how you implement your own theory. And just to give you an example, and this is the example that I focus on in the book with respect to the consequence approach and the, the rights approach. When we think about what we owe to wild animals, there can sometimes be a disagreement or at least a perceived disagreement. Because on one hand, if you think ethics is about the consequences and about maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering in the world, then you might think that we have a responsibility to intervene in wild animal suffering and improve the lives of wild animals because wild animals are suffering and dying all the time due to natural problems like hunger and thirst and illness and injury and predators and parasites. And of course, human activity like deforestation and development and transportation and agriculture and now pandemics and climate change and so on. So wild animals are suffering and dying all the time by the quintillions and we have the power to do something about it so we should do something about it so you might have a very pro-interventionist stance as a consequentialist but then rights people often say that actually uh we we do not have a moral obligation to intervene in the suffering of wild animals and in fact we might even have a moral obligation not to because that would be a, a kind of interference in the autonomy of wild animals. We would be uh, meddling in their affairs and, and violating, interfering with them uh, uh, for, for their own good in a kind of paternalistic way. And, and so not only is that not required, but it might actually be wrong. And my point in the book is that while both of those perspectives are well taken, each of them needs to be complicated in the real world and practice in a world reshaped by human activity. On one hand, consequentialists need to take seriously, as I said before, the limitations of our current knowledge and power and political will. They need to take seriously the reality that we currently know very little, have very little ability to intervene in the lives of wild animals in a way that we can be confident is going to do more good than harm. We just don't know nearly enough about what their lives are like and how our activity will impact them and what the long-term effects of our interventions will be. So you need to sort of be cautious and careful and humble uh, and selective about intervening in light of those realities. But then on the other hand, a rights theorist needs to accept the reality that, for example, human activity is increasingly complicit in wild animal suffering. This is not natural suffering anymore. Uh, we are transforming the world through human activity. Again, deforestation, development, transportation, agriculture, and human-caused climate change is systematically transforming the world. And so now, moving forward, when wild animals are suffering and dying, it'll always be an open question whether we had a hand in that. And to the degree that we have had a hand in what wild animals are now going through, we have a responsibility to help them, not because they're suffering from natural causes, but because they're suffering from human causes. And we have a responsibility to reduce and repair the harm that our own activity is, is causing them. So you start to see this partial convergence. Um, the consequentialists, they wanna help, but they need to be careful. And the rights theorists maybe don't wanna help, 
but now they acknowledge that they need to help a little bit because of our increasing complicity in, in these problems. And so we converge on the idea that we should help uh, cautiously, humbly, uh, selectively, strategically, when we can do so ethically and effectively without violating their rights in serious ways. And, and that's, I think, a good place to, to start because we can recognize this is a pluralistic view uh, around which we can build consensus and then we can work together in order to to take this approach, even if we disagree about which ethical theory is the right one. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and I, I found uh, this discussion about whether or not to intervene in wild animal lives is such a complicated question uh, and, and really challenging to resolve, as you say. Um, but sometimes I wonder, you know, within these sort of two opposing views that you point out, on the one hand, accepting responsibility for caring for wild animals in particular, or on the other hand, refraining from intervening out of respect for their autonomy or sovereignty. I worry sometimes that the, either of these views sort of reinforce an understanding of humans as separate from nature. Um, so to consider us as either caretakers of other species or as needing to hold ourselves back from impacting an external sovereign nature. Um, do you worry at all about that, that sort of argument about humans as part of nature or humans as separate from nature? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, I, I certainly think we are part of nature and that we need to accept that we are animals and, and we are natural and, and get rid of this sort of uh, nature culture or natural uh, artificial divide that, that sometimes we use in order to justify bad practices or a sense of human superiority. So, so I do worry a lot about that. And, and I think that, that the framing that you suggest is, is the better one. Um, and I also worry about other things. For example, I, I think humans are generally really bad at being able to assess how good or bad other lives are and assess what can improve other lives and what would worsen other lives. I mean, even within our own species, if you poll humans about how good or bad other people's lives are, uh, people will tend to make judgments about that that diverge a lot from what the people living those lives say about them. <laughs> and so so if our if our own judgments about how good or bad other human lives are can can sometimes be unreliable. Imagine how unreliable they become when we start to make judgments about very different kinds of sentient beings who don't have the opportunity to take polls and correct our mistakes. Uh, so so not only is there there a, a concern that we might think of ourselves as separate from and above nature, but there's also a concern that even if we're altruistically motivated, we might be acting on really bad assumptions about what other animals need and what it would take to treat them well. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of power over other animals and we're exercising that power whether we like it or not. And we're trapped in our human perspectives whether we like it or not. And so once again, I just think we need to strike a balance here. We need to be mindful of our bias, mindful of our ignorance, mindful of our place as part of nature, but also mindful of the power that we're wielding, the unavoidability at this point of wielding that power, and the need to do the best we can to reduce the harm that we're causing and, and just kind of muddle through as best we can. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it was an interesting discussion in uh, the book as well about, as you say, these limits to our ability to understand and evaluate what a good life is for other individuals or other species in particular. And I think that um, you highlight some of these complicated decisions around um, whether or not another life is worth living in, in terms of things like creation and things like euthanasia. Um, so maybe, if, if you could speak to that a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, this is one of the most complicated and, and fraught issues that I talk about in the book. And of course, there are a lot of complicated and fraught issues in the book, but there is this question about uh, what is the line between a good life in, in the sense of the life being worth living for its subject uh, and a bad life in the sense of a life not being worth living for its subject. Like, like when is life better for the subject than non-existence? And when is life worse for the subject than non-existence? And this is important because if you think that some lives can be so miserable and short that it would have been better not to exist at all, if you think that, 
then you really need to take that into account when making decisions, for example, about whether to lengthen or shorten a certain life or whether to bring more or fewer of a certain type of, of being into existence. Uh, for example, if a lot of animals do have lives worth living, then all else being equal, it seems better to create uh, more of those types of animals in the next generation, or at least allow more of those types of animals to come to existence in the next generation. But if particular animals do not have lives worth living, then it might actually be bad for them to, to cause or allow more of them to come into existence in, in the next generation. And so, so if you think things like that, that, that there can be some lives that are so bad that they might not be worth living, and that that bears on uh, what types of future populations we should bring about, that, that it is better to bring about people with lives that are more worth living and worse to bring about people with lives that are less worth living, then you really need to think about, okay, how good are the lives of other animals? And do many animals have lives that are not worth living? And when you, when you consider the fact that the vast majority of animals are either captive in factory farms, uh, experiencing lives that are really hard because of the way that we breed them to grow as big as possible, as fast as possible, and then mutilate them without anesthesia and keep them in crowded and toxic conditions and then slaughter them on industrial disassembly lines or wild animals who, again, are, are sometimes sipping from a lake and, and nibbling leaves from a tree, but other times suffering because of hunger, thirst, illness, injury, predation, parasitism, and, and fires and floods and, and so on. You have to take seriously this this question, and and all I point out here, I don't take a stand one way or the other about about whether animals have lives worth living on average or in total, and I also don't take a stand about what that means for whether we should be creating them or not creating them. But I do point out that assumptions about these issues are baked into our views about what kinds of infrastructure to build, uh, what kinds of health policies or environmental policies to accept. These are not value neutral decisions. Every decision that we make about health and environmental policy, about social services, about infrastructure is going to have implications for which animals come into existence, how many animals come into existence and how good or bad their lives will be. And so if they matter, we owe it to them to factor their lives and their their quality of life into that equation, which does require making value judgments about these really fraught issues, like when when life is good or bad. Yeah, thank you so much. It's um, yeah, it is such a complicated question, and reading your book really made me think a lot about that. Um, and I have a question that's sort of related, but. Um, I guess something that I struggle with in some of my own work is uh, this balance between pragmatism and action now, and then imagining and working towards radically different futures. And one of the subheadings in the conclusion of your book is we have no idea what kind of world to build for animals. Um, and you write that we might not know what kind of just multi-species, multinational, multi-generational society is achievable or sustainable right now, but the sooner we accept that we have a responsibility to pursue this goal, the sooner we can start figuring out. Um, so I, I, I really like this balance, um, but I would love to hear from you a little bit more about what your kind of um, more radical visions for a just multi-species future look like. So there's, a, I think, a more of a focus on the book on some of these the pragmatic uh, questions, but I'd love to hear yeah, about yeah. this longer-term vision. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think the the timing question is really important too, uh, at, for for the reasons that that you gestured at. It it does seem as though we should wait until we know more and can do more before we start making major changes. On the other hand, we might always feel like we don't know enough and that we can't do enough. And so it can be really easy to keep pushing it indefinitely into the future. And so I do think that we should be starting now. We should be doing more research and, and uh, changing some laws and, and uh, considering our impacts on animals more than we are. And if we do that, we might be able to build the knowledge that we need and build the power that we need and build the political will that we need for other more major changes in the future. And then to, to answer your question, I really don't think that, that we are in the position to think very concretely about what this just multi-species, multinational, multi-generational society will look like. But I will 
in the in the spirit of doing my best to answer your question, uh, and and because I I do think that positive visions, just, not just you you know dystopian, but sometimes utopian visions for the future can be motivating too. Like asking ourselves not not just what what will it look like if it goes badly wrong, but what could it look like if we get our acts together and 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 make it better than than it it might have otherwise been. Uh, that can be useful motivationally uh, and and conceptually. So with that said. I think, first of all, it would look like a plant based global food system. We would end factory farming. We would end deforestation. We would end the wildlife trade. We would end our uses, exploitation, extermination of animals for food and clothing and research and medicine and entertainment and other purposes. And we would scale up plant based alternatives, including at least during the transition, uh, plant based meat and cell based meat, which are derived from plants or cell cultures and then made in factories. Uh, and that way we would feed the world, uh, you know, healthful, sustainable, uh, delicious, uh, affordable food and treat animals better and treat global health and the environment better. Uh, we would also have a radically different kind of infrastructure. We would have an infrastructure designed from the ground up to accommodate everyone in our communities, human and non-human. And so we would have, for example, overpasses and underpasses on roads and wildlife corridors. Uh, and of course, instead of roads, we would have public transportation systems, much more trains and, and so on, with overpasses and underpasses to reduce collisions with animals. Cities would be designed to minimize light pollution that hurt, hurts animals, minimize collisions with birds and windows by having better, better glass for, for buildings, uh, and just in, in all sorts of other ways, bee bricks for bree, bees, and, and so on and so forth. We would just be thinking from the ground up about how all of our citizens uh, can can best be accommodated. And by the way, animals would be citizens or or whatever other form of, of political membership we accept at that point. Um, they they would have legal status and political status. They would be be legal persons or legal subjects. They would be political citizens or political members. They would be parts of our communities and we would accept that we have moral and, and legal and political responsibilities to them, which would be part of why we wouldn't be using them for food uh, or, or in these other objectifying, instrumentalizing, commodifying ways anymore. They would be fellow citizens, fellow creatures, and we would be using resources to care for them rather than to exterminate them when there's any kind of <laughs> tension or conflicts between humans and other animals. And we would represent them in our political processes. We would uh, have, have new systems of government that can represent the interests of everyone impacted by our behavior, other nations, other generations, and other species. So, so those are just some examples of what I think a just future will look like. But we got to design that stuff, and that'll take some time. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I think we're going to get to the Q and A from the audience soon. But I did want to take the opportunity to just bring up what I think is one of the most challenging questions in in my mind when I think about these issues. Um, and so. It comes up a few times in the book, uh, you know, for me, where there's this tension I perceive between things like coalition building and intersectionality on the one hand, um, and then, you know, possible risks of cultural imperialism on the other hand. So you write about that we need pluralistic coalitions and helping animals requires addressing social, economic and environmental justice issues. Um, but you also write about things like the need to persuade um, people that plant-based uh, and cultivated meat products are consistent with personal, cultural, and religious identities. And so I know this is a bit of a tricky argument, but um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the, the possible charge of, um, you know, cultural imperialism around other groups' uh, relationships with animals. Yeah, this is definitely a complicated issue, and and I, I do try to address it uh, as as much as I can in in the book. Although obviously I I don't do that or really any issue any single issue that I discuss uh, a, a enough justice just because I I try to cover so much ground in, in the book. But I I do think this is really complicated, and once again I think this is an area where we need to strike a delicate balance because it is true that we need to build coalitions, and it also is true that achieving health and environmental justice and for that matter justice for animals does require also achieving justice for humans um, which means to to a very significant degree accepting the choices and cultures and religious traditions of other humans even when we disagree with them that is what it means to be in a liberal and pluralistic and tolerant uh, and accepting culture and i think that is the kind of culture we should be aiming for 
But we do need to strike a balance because I do believe, again, as I said, that non-human animals should be regarded as members of our communities as well. And even though we do think that we have cultural and religious freedoms and individual personal freedoms, we also ordinarily accept in, in our societies that our freedoms end where violations of others' basic rights and liberties begin. And, and so we generally do have a right to make our own choices and live our own lives, but we don't have a right to do that in a way that violates the basic interests and needs and rights of other vulnerable beings unnecessarily. And so when practices do violate the, the basic rights and liberties of non-human animals unnecessarily, I do think that there can be justification for limiting those practices. Um, but I also recognize that there is a long tradition of singling out uh, marginalized or minoritized populations in their practices for censure or, or regulation while allowing mainstream practices that are much more harmful in the aggregate to go unregulated. And, and so in general, what I think is we should be prioritizing mainstream practices that are causing much more harm in the aggregate for regulation um, to the degree that we do regulate activity under the law, we shouldn't, um, you know, use like carceral systems in order to enforce uh, these laws in ways that might uh, reinforce uh, classist and racist criminal justice systems of the kind that we have in the United States, for example. And we can be thoughtful um, and, and nuanced about how we go about advocating for these types of changes. For example, there are enough people in every cultural and religious tradition advocating for better treatment of animals within that cultural and religious tradition. I don't need to go into a culture that is not authentically mine and tell people how they ought to understand their own beliefs and values. There are people in that culture <laughs> arguing for, for various kinds of better treatment of animals uh, with, with the authority and legitimacy to be making those arguments within that culture. So there's no need for, for me to go around doing that. Instead, I can create space for people to, to make those arguments within each culture and where, where it would be possible or, or desirable I can amplify the voices of people already making those arguments or help divert resources to them so they can do their work more productively. So, so yeah, in general, we need to respect human cultures. We need to respect human religions. We need to be mindful of our history of colonialism and imperialism and not repeat those mistakes. But we also shouldn't let toleration of human difference be a license to happily continue killing, you know, trillions of non-human animals unnecessarily uh, against their will. Uh, we should be making thoughtful changes in legal reforms without using those legal, legal reforms as a pretext to single out human cultures, to, to reinforce racism or classism, uh, and, and uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, complicated issue, balance is necessary, and that's the, the best I can do to <laughs> uh, gesture at what kind of balance I think is necessary in, in, uh, quickly. Great. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughts on that. And just looking at the time, I think I'm going to take a look at the Q&A now and see what we've got. Um, so there's a question from uh, Wendy who says, thanks very much for the talk. You talked about rights and consequences, but I was wondering which other ethical perspectives have influenced you in your thinking about animals. How else can moral philosophers intervene productively in this kind of area? Yeah, there are all kinds of, thank you for the question, all kinds of moral traditions. Um, I focused on the consequences view and the rights view for the sake of simplicity and specificity, but uh, I also gesture in the book at some other views that have been really influential for me, and I'll, I'll mention two. One is called virtue ethics, and, and this is all about uh, becoming a virtuous person by cultivating through practice and, and reinforcement character traits that will lead you to naturally be a good person without thinking about it. And the basic idea here, among other things, is that most of what we do is not a result of me thinking about what to do and making a conscious decision by applying principles. Most of what we do is a matter of acting on instinct or habit or routine or doing what feels natural in the moment. And so if we want to do the right thing consistently, we ought to think not only about what principles to follow in those moments where we reflect about principles, but also uh, what kind of person to turn ourselves into by internalizing the right dispositions and character traits. And that way we can just naturally do the right thing without even thinking about it in our everyday lives. I think that is so important. And it really requires thinking about how we see animals, how we talk about animals, those, those basic habits uh, about how we orient ourselves towards animals that just kind of naturally incline us towards more respectful 
compassionate forms of, of treatment. Um, and then another is care theory, feminist care theory. And, and this is all about cultivating caring relationships with, with people and, and not just treating people well in the context of relationships that we already have, but also being mindful of relationships that we might be finding ourselves in, like economic relationships and political race relationships, and making sure that um, we are finding ourselves embedded in relationships that are liberatory and respectful and supportive rather than exploitative or oppressive. Uh, and, and so thinking relationally and structurally, how, how do the relationships and structures that we find ourselves embedded in, um, how does that orient us towards others? Are, are we just um, reinforcing structures that contribute to exploitation uh, or, or can we re remove ourselves from that? So thinking about consequences, rights, character traits, and relationships and structures, I think those are the four pillars that are most useful to be thinking about together. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Karsten who asks, how do you make determinations of what to do when anthropocentric reasons, so general welfare of humanity or for specific groups of humans, conflict with biocentric or ecocentric considerations? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, ultimately, there are going to be trade-offs, conflicts, tensions between what we want for ourselves and what other animals need and and we need to think about how to resolve those uh, for strategic reasons i i spend a lot of time in the book emphasizing co-beneficial solutions so all sorts of low-hanging fruit ways that treating animals better will treat humans better so so that natural interpretation of saving animals saving ourselves so for example things like ending factory farming deforestation and the wildlife trade is unequivocally better for farmed animals and uh, many of the wild animals who are caught up in these systems and for humans because of the way these systems contribute to pandemics and climate change and, and other global threats. Um, and there are other low hanging fruit things that we can do that are co-beneficial again, like building wildlife corridors and transportation systems or installing bird friendly glass on buildings and, and vehicles. And I suggest starting there because that'll be the easiest sell helping animals in a way that also helps us. And it will help us normalize and get a little bit better at including them in the conversations. And then when we make some of those low hanging fruit changes and include them in the conversations and get better at this and build our knowledge and power and political will, then we can start tackling the other issues where there might actually be conflicts and tensions. And the other reason I, I wanna push those uh, into the future is that if we make some of the infrastructural changes I recommend, we might ac actually prevent some of those conflicts from arising in the first place. So a lot of conflicts we currently perceive with the right structural solutions, they might not as, ar arise as much in the future. But when in the future there inevitably still is some conflict between humans and other animals, this is now where where some of you might might start to deviate from me, maybe you started deviating from me earlier in the conversation. I personally believe that at some point we ought to take seriously the possibility that we really should make some sacrifices as a species in order to improve the, the lives of members of other species. There are about 8 billion humans. There are quintillions of other animals. If you just think about it in the aggregate, we represent only a tiny fraction of the overall amount of happiness and suffering and welfare in general on the planet. And so if we're thinking in terms of justice and equity, then at some point, I think we need to take seriously the possibility of maybe not giving all the resources and care to the other animals, but giving much more than we currently are, even if it means accepting minor sacrifices on behalf of our own species. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question here from Christina who asks, the more I read and think of animal rights or justice issues, the more it seems evident to me that it's unlikely to occur, occur in a capitalist system predicated on the exploitation of human and animal capital in all forms. If the world cannot shake the consumerist and infantile economic growth parasite, what chance do we have to build a just future for human and non-human animals alike? Are you addressing this question at your, in your book at all? Is transformation from the capitalist system possible? Yes, that's a great question. I do address it in the book, but I don't discuss it at length. I, I, I explain how this question is, is relevant. So, so basically, as, as I noted before, I think that we can do some things to treat animals better within existing structures and systems. But at some point, we also have to question the structures and systems themselves. And that includes things like, what should the legal and political and economic status of animals be within, for instance, liberal, democratic, and capitalist systems? But then also, 
should we continue to accept liberal or democratic or capitalist systems in the first place, or should we um, replace them with fundamentally different types of political and economic systems? And and I do note that um, if, if you are pro, for example, liberal democratic capitalism, there are significant things that we can do to improve our relationships with animals within those systems. For example, if animals become legal persons with their own legal rights, then that would help. Right now they have the legal status of objects within our, our systems. If animals uh, become political citizens with representation rights, their, their interests have to be represented by legislative bodies, for, for example, then that would be better for them within democratic systems, finding innovative ways to, to um, recover their voices and include their voices in, in our political processes. And if they're no longer property or commodities within capitalist systems, but are rather conceived of as individuals who can have their own territorial rights, who can own things rather than being things who are owned, then that would, of course, improve their standing in capitalist systems. Now, you might think that only goes so far, we should still go farther, we should be anti-capitalist, maybe even uh, anti-liberal or democratic, given how much democracies are crumbling and not functioning properly right now. I'm all for having those arguments and very sympathetic with some of those arguments, uh, though, though I will note that, of course, alternatives to these systems also have their problems and we need to evaluate liberalism, capitalism, and democracy um, against their realistic counterparts as opposed to like idealistic counterparts that we might be imagining but would be very hard to implement in the real world. All I'm saying in this book uh, and in general is that when we have those conversations, when we ask about our basic systems and structures, we include the interests and needs of other animals and people in other nations and future generations when we're having those discussions. Whatever systems we build, we need to build them in ways that are considering equitably the interests and needs of everyone affected by our behavior, no matter uh, what their national or generational or biological uh, categories are. Great, uh, and we've got a question from Lewis. In plant thinking, Michael Martyr raises ethical questions related to our interactions with vegetal life. Do you think this is a step too far? And if so, why? I, thank you for this question. I addressed this towards the end of the book uh, and, and in the very the very final section of the book, I, I address it as well. Um, so, so in the book, I'm assuming that if you are able to experience pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering, then you definitely matter and we definitely have an obligation to consider you. And I'm also assuming that at the very least, many, many, many animals are sentient in that sense, capable of experiencing pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering. Um, and, and so I think at the very least, we have a responsibility to consider many animals, all vertebrates and many invertebrates for those reasons, uh, because all vertebrates and many invertebrates are either are, or at least are likely to be uh, sentient and sentience is enough. But I also entertain the possibility that we should go beyond those animals and also consider plants, also consider maybe uh, future generation artificial intelligences, other types of beings like that. Um, either because it might be that even if sentience is enough, maybe life is enough too, something even broader than sentience. Um, may, maybe we should accept that all living beings, uh, all self-organizing and reproducing beings, however we want to describe it, maybe at some point our species will think just that alone is enough for you to matter for your own sake and for me to consider your interests when deciding how to treat you. And it might be that further science and philosophy reveals that we actually should think of even plants or artificial intelligences as reasonably likely to be sentient, not just alive, but but capable of experiencing pleasure and pain in a certain certain sense. Um, I'm currently thinking plants probably are not sentient and and they probably don't matter for their own sakes. But every generation has thought that they had the answers. And then, you know, future generations were like, oh, they really didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> they should not have drawn the line where they drew the line. So yeah, I think probably we don't need to go all the way to plants, but I'll, I'm also, I recognize my position in this lineage of people who have never drawn the line expansively enough. And I'm open to the possibility that we're gonna need to draw it uh, more expansively than I currently am. Okay, great. Um, we maybe only have time for one more question. Um, maybe we'll fit in two. Uh, but Rose is wondering if you could clarify what you mean by animals becoming citizens or having citizenship rights. Uh, 
And also, uh, to what extent do you think COVID has impacted the way we think about animal rights? Got it. Yes, I'll try to answer this quickly so that we maybe have time for one more. We'll see. Uh, so, so I recommend the book Zoopolis by Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka, which is all about what it would look like to extend existing categories of political membership, like citizenship or sovereignty, to non-human animals. And as Donaldson and Kimlicka note in that book. To say that animals, certain types of animals should be citizens is not necessarily to say that they should have all the rights that I might have as a citizen. But as we know, even in the human case, citizenship rights are layered. There are all sorts of citizenship rights. I have the right as a citizen of the United States to, for example, participate in elections and run for public office and that kind of thing. But I also have more basic rights uh, that I don't need specifically like my capacities in order to exercise. I have the right to uh, have my interests represented by the political process. I have the right to reside in the territory I was born in and return to that territory if I leave. And even if animals aren't capable of running for public office or, or voting an election, I mean, we can debate that, <laughs> but even if you think they're not capable of that, they're still capable of having their interests represented in the political process or residing in or returning to the territory they were born in. And so all it means to call particular animal citizens is to say they should have those rights of citizenship that are appropriate to them, given their capacities and interests and needs. And that might be some, but not all of the ones that we attribute to ourselves. Thank you so much. Um, so this is something that uh, you've maybe touched on a bit, but maybe you could elaborate on. How can we, Victoria asks, how can we balance out the trade-offs of using resources to help animals with the fact that this will let, leave less resources for meeting basic human needs, i.e. combating world hunger, providing health care, providing clean water? Great question and a good question to end on. And I'll try to be quick here too, because I know we need to wrap up. So, so the first thing to say is, is again, uh, the low hanging fruit opportunities to treat animals better will treat humans better too. For example, if we end factory farming and animal agriculture and replace it with plant based alternatives, we would use substantially less land and water and produce substantially less antibiotic resistance, uh, contaminated food, uh, uh, global health threats, zoonotic disease outbreaks, and, and of course, fires and floods and other extreme weather events caused by climate change. So in those respects, there are all kinds of ways to treat animals better that really actually are better for us and make the air and water and everything cleaner and get, leave more resources left over for humans to use. Um, but beyond that, I take your point and I agree with you. And this is part of why I said we need to be humble and cautious. Think about it like a human. You know, I, I want to do the most good possible in my life. But I also need to engage in a certain amount of self care, um, both because I deserve that and because uh, I need that in order to be able to do altruistic work effectively and sustainably and keep my motivation over time. So in practice, I have to strike a balance. I can't, you know, um, devote every waking hour and dollar that I have to altruistic projects or I'll burn out and I'll stop doing it in week two. So instead, what I should do is start modestly, maybe start by donating 10% of, of my disposable income make sure I can do that sustainably and then inch up from there um, until I reach the point where it's starting to feel unsustainable for me and I can level off. And I think the same should be true for our species. We can't give all resources to other species, but we need to give, keep some for ourselves because we deserve it and because we need to improve human lives and social and political and economic systems in order to be able to effectively and sustainably as a species improve the lives of other animals. So as in the individual case, we should start modestly um, do the low hanging fruit things that are good for us too. then allocate like 0.1% of our GDP <laughs> to helping other animals and then inch up from there again until we reach the point where where it's no longer sustainable. My view is that we should help them as much as we sustainably can, even if that means not helping them as much as we deserve and recognizing that that will be a moving target that that amount can keep going up and up and up as we get better at this.